The books of Samuel tell the tale of two kings. They contain the true story of epic battles and valiant warriors and slaying giants and political intrigue. These are the true stories of deep friendships and stolen thrones and sexual misconduct and murder. And they contain the most amazing soundtrack. This is the dawning of the kingdom of Israel. Here we see the rise of the great kings from within the people of God. And this is God setting up his world for the coming of the one and true and forever king over all. This epic story opens with a simple barren woman married to a backcountry polygamist in the, a dusty old hill town smack dab in the middle of Israel. Good morning, I'm Jamie. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone. It is my honor and privilege to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're starting a new series this morning. We're calling it Kingdom Come, and Lord willing, we'll give the next several months to working our way through the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. Today, we will be in 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll work through this passage a section at a time, and it should take us around 30 minutes or so. But before I jump in, I would like to pray. So if you will, please join your heart with mine as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, holy is your name. You are great and you are glorious. Lord, it still astounds us that you, Lord Jesus, would put on human flesh, bear our sin to the cross, carry our shame to the grave. It is still a wonder to us that your resurrection gave us life. It still blows uh, our minds that you would think to take up residence in our lives by your Spirit. For all that you have done and for all that you are worth, will you make us a people who walk worthy of the Lord. Give us to die to our sin every day that we may be raised to new life. Lord, we want to be dead to sin. We want to be dead to selfishness. We want to be dead to the world. Close our ears to the voice of the charmer who plays on our sinful desires. And would you cure us of pride, a fear of man, of a love of admiration? Will you make us unafraid to be called old-fashioned? Lord, keep us from seeking to be relevant at the cost of being godly. And may we be content to be rejected, misunderstood, willing to take up unpopular truths and to be despised for doing so. Would you give us courage for all of our trials? Give us grace for joy. Make us a happy and holy people. Free us from every wrong desire, everything contrary to your will. And may your word rule us. May your resurrection life strengthen us. Remind us, Father, of your priorities, of your purpose. Shape our worldview through the inflexible truth of your word. And make our minds and hearts malleable to your gentle correction. Father, we desire to lead a peaceful and quiet life, dignified in every way, in order that your gospel may advance in our city. And to this end, we pray for our mayor, Chris Lee. Lord, give him wisdom to lead this city through this difficult time. Grant that he and our city council and our city managers would decide and act in accordance with your will for the good of our city, that our God would be glorified and his gospel known. In Jesus' name, amen. 
1 Samuel chapter 1. Let's read the opening, verse 1 and 2. This is the word of the Lord. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. First and Second Samuel are really one book. We don't know who wrote these books. They chronicle the events which took place about a thousand years before the Lord Jesus was born. It covers a period of transition in ancient Israel, moving from being a tribal confederacy to a theistic monarchy. It is the rise of Israel's first two kings, Saul and David. Samuel, from whom the book gets its name, is a transitional figure, a sort of priest, prophet, and judge. And this book opens on Samuel's mother, a woman named Hannah. Now, Hannah plays only a small part of this epic story. However, her part is in no way insignificant. You see, when God is writing your story for his glory, everything is incredibly significant. Hannah is one of the great characters of the Bible. She is one of a handful of precious women through whom the Lord sang the song of the glory of his beloved son. And her story of infertility and difficulty in marriage is God's story. And I trust that you will see as this chapter unfolds that when God's people humble themselves, handing their situation over to the Lord, He will add their story to the great symphony of praise to His glorious Son. That's really the main point that I would like to draw out of this chapter this morning. When God's people humble themselves in affliction, they are lifted up and used by the Lord to accomplish His global plan to magnify His glorious Son. I don't know the difficulties you are facing today. I don't know what hardship or stresses or afflictions you're enduring. But if you're anything like me, affliction has a way of shrinking your perspective. It's sort of like looking through binoculars in the wrong side. Everything gets small, it gets closed in, and everything seems far away. The only thing you can think about and focus on is your own problem. And Hannah's problems are not small. They're big, as we will see. But when Hannah humbled herself and turned to her Lord, she saw the bigness of her Lord. She didn't know it, of course, but the Lord would use her simple faith to accomplish his extraordinary plan of redemption. And I trust that as you encounter her and her faith and her God, you will be encouraged as I have been to hand your afflictions to the Lord and to see them as consequential as providential, as a means of making much of Jesus. That's my prayer for you this morning. May the Lord do this and more for all of us. There was a backcountry Levite living in the hill country of Ephraim. The Levites were the priestly tribe of the people of Israel. They were not given land in Canaan. Instead, they had to settle in the land of their fellow tribesmen. Elkanah, we are told, had two wives. Polygamy was not super common in those days, especially if you were a commoner. Polygamy was never God's intention from the beginning. You remember, he created one man and one woman. 
And polygamy is never condoned in the law of God. Polygamy always causes problems every time it appears in the Bible, as we shall see shortly. Elkanah's wives are named Hannah and Penina. Hannah is named first, likely because she's his first wife. And Hannah, the Bible says, had no children. Whereas Penina, as we will see, had many children. Now I need to say at the outset, infertility is a very difficult thing. And those who have never struggled with infertility have a hard time understanding how difficult infertility really is. It's no wonder that Rachel in the Bible told her husband, give me a child or I will die. Those of us who have been blessed with children, we would do well to be slow to speak, quick to listen, quicker still to pray for those who haven't been given children. There are some in our church who have struggled with infertility, some in our church who still struggle with infertility. And we would ask that you would please forgive us if we have ever been terse or dismissive of your pain. Please show us grace when we think that we have the answers and when we think that we know what it's like. Please, if I can ask, dear sisters, lean in to the story of your great-grandmother and be encouraged as you endure your affliction with the same humble, God-exalting faith that Hannah did. Infertility is difficult in any day, and especially so in ancient Israel. Just, just think for a moment, the human mandate from God on high was be fruitful and multiply. And then God had chosen a special people for himself from a man named Abraham, promising Abraham, that man, that his descendants would be like the stars. Every Israelite woman no doubt knew her own people's history. In Egypt, her grandmothers were so fertile that they had so many babies that they became a threat to the Egyptian nation. And when God delivered uh, Israel out of Egypt and into the land of promise, he gave them this promise. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall be the fruit of your womb. None shall miscarry or be barren. Hannah certainly knew the history of her own people and the promises of her own God. And yet the Bible says Hannah had no children. Add to this that it is very likely that because of Hannah's barren womb, her husband, seeking a son to carry the family name, took another wife. So what was Hannah to him? She, she ate his food. She slept under his roof. And she gave him no children. Dark was the plight of this precious woman, and heavy was the hand of God on her life. This we will see further unfolded for us in verses 3 to 8. Here we read of Hannah's affliction. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her. 
though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously, to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on, year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. And therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do, do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Now, I'm usually pretty hard on the men of the Bible, as you know. But let's, let's give homeboy a little credit here. He initiates with his wife in her pain, and that's good. Husbands, we should engage with our wives when they're hurting. <laughs> but let the record show this man gave what is possibly the worst comfort a grieving spouse could ever receive in the history of the world. <laughs> He's saying, sweetheart, I know you want to have babies. I know you can't have babies, but you know, you got me. Sisters, please be kind to the buffoonery of your male counterparts. We're often more foot in mouth than comfort in mouth. Elkanah no, no doubt meant well by saying this to his dear wife. And here we are told that Elkanah led his family in worship to the Lord year by year. This man, despite his poor counsel and his polygamy, sought to lead his family well in a time in Israel's history when very few men did this. Faithfully led his family to sacrifice to God in Shiloh every year. It was part of the worship a uh, ceremony to, to share the meat from the sacrifice. And Elkanah distributed the meat from the sacrifice to his whole family, to Penina, his second wife, and to all, notice all, Penina's sons and daughters. And when he came to distribute to Hannah, verse 5 says, he gave a double portion to her because he loved her. One wonders whether or not he shared with her out of his own portion. The end of verse 5 hits hard. The Lord had closed her womb. And just in case you missed it the first time, it, you're hit with it again in verse 6. The Lord had closed her womb. The author wants the reader to know that Hannah's plight through infertility was from the Lord. It is phrases like this in the Bible that should cause us in our affliction to put our hands over our mouths. Not in resignation to our pain, but in resignation to the Lord's providence. Hannah, Hannah doesn't give herself over to apathy, as, as we will see soon. And nor does Hannah make demands of God, as we will also see soon. Hannah is humble. May the Lord train us, His people, to resign our lives to His will, knowing in faith that whatever He deems to be our lot, it is for our ultimate good. Of course, Hannah had no way of knowing it at the time, but the hand of the Lord was working in her life, indeed, inside her very womb, to accomplish the global plan to magnify the greatness of His glorious Son. But that would come many years from now. Now is a time to endure. And she endures. Year after year. Month after month. The constant reminder 
that her womb is empty. No doubt wondering each month, what is wrong with me? Furthermore, sweet Hannah endures the provocation of her rival, her hateful sister wife, Penina. How she must have felt like excess baggage on those trips to Shiloh. How every festival would remind her that she's still not a mother. How she must have faked every smile from every joke, every silly thing that someone else's kid would do. And how she must have struggled to rejoice at the news that one of her friends was pregnant again. And therefore we read in verse 7, Hannah wept and would not eat. If I can't fill this belly with a baby, why fill it with food? These were dark days. But the Lord was with her. And he was about to do something no one expected. Let's keep reading. Verse 9 to 20. This is Hannah's petition. And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. What a story. What a God. Let's, let's go back up to verse 9 and just quickly note that this sweetheart of a woman, after hearing her husband's moronic attempt at comforting her, ate and drank and got up. She didn't throw his bad advice back into his face. She gave him the benefit of the doubt, which is so hard to do when you are in pain. But she saw through his bumbling, she saw his attempt to love her and comfort her, and she got up, and where did she go? She went to the Lord in prayer. And here's where we are introduced to a man named Eli. Eli is a priest of the Lord, who's serving the Lord at Shiloh. You see, when God's people moved into the land and settled there, they placed the Ark of the Covenant in a place called Shiloh. The Ark of the Covenant was a golden box upon which the presence of God dwelt on earth. It was here, placed in Shiloh, that God's people would come and worship the Lord and offer sacrifices to Him. They must have constructed some kind of building to house the Ark, and this is where Eli worked. 
But what you should know about Eli is that he is very old and very blind and very ignorant. He's not a good father and he's not a good priest. His sons, Phineas and Ferb or something, are worthless men. Eli sees Hannah praying to the Lord under her breath and he assumes, well, she's drunk. Or maybe he's just used to seeing drunk woman, women in the temple of God, or maybe he's just dumb. I don't know why he thought that, but this is the state of religion in those days. And here in her deep distress, she is weeping before the Lord. Hannah took her affliction and turned it to a petition. She makes a vow. This isn't bargaining with God. This is not demanding of God. This is making a promise to God. Verse 11. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. There are several instructive and important things to note in Hannah's prayer. First, notice she addresses the Lord as Lord of hosts. This is an acknowledgement of God's greatness, His control over everything. He is the commander of the armies of heaven. He is big and powerful and sovereign. Second, she acknowledges her own place. She calls herself the servant of the Lord. Again, this is a resignation to the Lord and to His will for her life. She is His servant. Does the servant have a right to demand what the master does with her life? Does the clay have the right to tell the potter how to make him? Third, she makes her request known to God. This, we see, is her faith. She recognizes that God has the right to give her a baby or not. It's in his hands. And she turns to him. Notice she says, if you will look upon my affliction, if you will remember me. She knows that she can't force her will on God. She makes no demands of God. She humbles herself before God. Fourth, notice that she makes a vow. She says, if you give me a son, I will give him to you. I was thinking about this this, this week as I was meditating on this passage. She didn't ask for sons. She didn't say, if you give me sons, I'll give one of them to you. She says, if you give me a son, I will give him to you. Well, what if the Lord only gives her one son? Then she still will not have contributed to her family. But her priority is to the Lord before anything else. And so she says, if you give me a son, I will give him to you. And then she adds, no razor shall touch his head. This is a reference to something called the Nazarite vow. It was a vow that a person would take in dedication of themselves to the Lord. Part of that vow meant that they would never touch anything dead and that they would never uh, eat or drink anything from a vine and that no razor would touch their head. Normally a Nazarite vow was a temporary thing, but Hannah is dedicating her yet-to-be-born son to a life of service as a Nazarite before the Lord. Hannah teaches us as Christians that no affliction in our life is accidental. No affliction in our life is incidental. There is no such thing as a Christian as coincidence. Your life has been ordered by and protected by and is being carried along by the Lord of the universe and that whatever he brings us into, it is a custom-fitted gift to shape you into the image of his son in order to bring glory to his name. When the Apostle Paul felt himself utterly burdened beyond his strength, when he felt that he had received the sentence of death, he explained it like this, but this was to make us rely not on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. Maybe your affliction is leaving you feeling utterly burdened beyond your strength. And I want you to know that is great news because that's exactly what it was meant to do. It's meant to bring you beyond your strength in order for you to rely completely and utterly on God and God alone. And that, my dear friend, is for your ultimate good. 
Hannah gave her affliction over to the Lord and she took her anxiety and she took her vexation and laid them at the Lord's feet. She had no way of knowing whether the Lord would give her a son. Whether he did or whether he didn't, she was still his servant. Hers was still his life. He was the God who could open wombs. He was the God who would close wombs. And whatever he willed for her life, she would receive. When Eli finally comes around and realizes this isn't a drunk woman, he gives her his priestly blessing. Verse 17, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made to him. And then sweet Hannah replies, let, the, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then, and then notice in verse 18, Matt Flora pointed this out to me last Sunday. She went her way and ate. And her face was no longer sad. She took her affliction, she laid it in the Lord's hands. She received the priestly blessing. She got up the next day, worshiped the Lord, and went home. Did Hannah know that God was going to give her a son? No. But she humbled herself, prayed, trusted the Lord with her life. She ate a meal. She washed her face. She went to church. She just went about her life. Isn't it interesting all of the mentions in this chapter of eating? In her distress, Hannah did not eat. And then after Elkanah's hilarious attempt to comfort her, she eats. And then here again, after pouring her heart out before the Lord, she went her way, and the narrator says she ate. I, I just wonder what the narrator is telling us. It seems to me that this is just illustrating Hannah's resignation to the Lord's will. She made her petition, she trusted the Lord, she received the blessing. She accepted her lot in life. She ate and went about her life. She knew the Lord was good. She knew that he would accomplish his purpose through her life. And, and, and some of you, like Hannah, have been pouring out your heart to the Lord for a very long time. And heaven, to this point, has been silent. And I want you to know the Lord hears you. He hears every last word. He hears every ache of your heart. He sees every failed pregnancy test. He, he sees every failed test result. Every worry of your heart that the bills might not get, bit, get paid. The Lord hears the sigh of your heart about a wayward child. You are never alone weeping in your bedroom. You are never alone when you get hung up on and cry. The Lord hears. The Lord sees. And the Lord never forgets. Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. The Lord remembered her is maybe one of the most precious phrases in the whole Bible. In Hebrew, the name Samuel sounds like asked for. I have asked for him from the Lord. The Lord remembered her. That was Hannah's answer. I don't know what your answer is. It could be that you'll have an answer for everything you've prayed for. It could be that God has something else in mind. What I do know is that God has a great big plan for your great big pain. And it might be to deliver you out of it, but it might be to sustain you through it. But somehow or another, your affliction will nestle itself into the great symphony of eternal praise of Almighty God. When you humble yourself and turn it over to the Lord, He will use it. 
to establish his word. We wrap up our time together in verse 21 to 28. We've seen Hannah's affliction. We've seen Hannah's petition. And now we see Hannah's contribution. Verse 21. This man, Elkanah, and his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Elkanah, as always, goes up to worship the Lord at Shiloh. And Hannah asks if she can stay back with Samuel. She has other business with God. She tells Elkanah that she's dedicated their son to the Lord. I suppose he could have put his foot down. But this is a good husband. And he blesses his wife, which maybe makes up for his earlier mistake, and says, do what seems best to you. May the Lord establish his word. Now, it was the custom in those days to nurse a child for three years. And I suspect that this is the timing that Hannah had in mind to dedicate Samuel. Because if you catch it there, she brought a three-year-old bull along with her to Shiloh. So that means that her little boy and this bull grew up together. And she would offer both of them to the Lord. Just think of this. She had nursed this boy for three years. She had celebrated three birthdays. He, he, he's three years old. He's, he's running around. He's, he's talking. He's calling her mama. Finally, someone calls her mama. How hard it must have been for her to leave him. But she had vowed to the Lord and she would keep her vow. And then we come to verse 27. For this child, I've prayed. I recently saw this phrase on a sign hanging above the crib of some dear friends of mine who have also prayed, and the Lord gave them a child. I don't know if anyone but a mother can truly understand the depths of those words. For this child, I've prayed. There's a play on words going on here. The name Samuel, as I mentioned, sounds like asked from the Lord, but it also sounds like given to the Lord. What she had received from the Lord, Hannah now gives to the Lord. Maybe you feel like your life hasn't amounted to much. Maybe you haven't accomplished the things that you set out to do in your life. Maybe you don't feel like you've made a contribution to society. Maybe you're still in a dead-end job. Maybe you've reinvented yourself a dozen or so times and you still can't find your place. And I want you to hear this, friend. Hannah foreshadows for us what we see in full view in the Lord Jesus Christ. God cares about nobodies. Jesus Christ left the glory of heaven and took infinite condescension in order to be with nobodies. 
So that through nobodies he would build the greatest kingdom this world has ever known or ever will know. And rather than viewing your life through binoculars turned the wrong way around, turn your eyes to the bigness of God in Jesus Christ on his sinner's cross. See the affliction of Jesus suffered for your sake. See the full weight of your sin falling on him. See him suffering the penalty of your sins in his death on his cross. And through his resurrection, see the promise that he gives of new life to all who turn to him by faith. Friend, humble yourself. Confess the sin of your pride and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ to be filled with his very presence. This is how your life will truly count for something. Hand the gift he has given to you back to him by faith and nothing that you give to God will ever be wasted. Turn to him and see how he will use ordinary people like you and I to accomplish his extraordinary mission to make much of his glorious son. Let's pray. Lord, we admit that we have not viewed our affliction rightly. We've been crippled by it. We've become bitter over it. We've thought ourselves undeserving of it. And Lord, we recognize that we are your servants and that we have no right to demand of you. Will you forgive us? Will you forgive us for bristling against your hand against your gentle correction. Forgive us, Lord, for believing that we know better for our lives than you. Make us your humble servants who turn to you in prayer, trusting our lives to your good and capable hands. And use us for your sake, for your glory, and for the accomplishment of your mission to make much of Jesus. Protect us from wasting our lives on any other thing. In Jesus' name, and for Jesus' praise. Your assurance of pardon this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Grace and peace.